weren't here last time, my name is Charlie Seaman, and I have the pleasure of uh, being with you all uh, through this series. I hope that I'll be able to be here, everyone, and I hope that um, my lecture uh, got you thinking uh, about we need a different way of doing business, and we're going to explore in each of these lectures various aspects of it. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you Peter Hen. Um, Peter is with F, 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 with a division of the Blackstone Group. He started out as a lawyer at Greenberg Trari in the land use department, migrated to uh, the development world, and for the last three years has been working on behalf of LXR, the division of Blackstone, on some of the major resort properties here in South Florida. And uh, in my remarks, I said to you that this new planning model that I think we need has got to engage the market, not regulate. We need to find a way uh, to to take advantage of, of the market to create the kind of communities and places we want. And so we've asked Peter as someone who's been going through it, going through it in this community, going through it with regard to one of the few sustainable economies that actually exist in South Florida now, the maritime and commerce industry in Fort Lauderdale, Broward County, and, and to share with you the perspective of the private sector as a, as a component, as a potential, I hope, participant in this new planning great pleasure we've had. This is my partner, Wendy Larson, who I introduced to come. Wendy and I have been doing the same thing uh, for more than 30 years. Uh, we've had the opportunity to represent Peter a number of different times in different circumstances. And he's always struck me as, as one of the, uh, a, a developer who really stands out because he's constantly asking questions about can't we do better? Why isn't our planning system responding to this? Why are we not looking why do we have a two-year horizon instead of five or a 10 or a 20? And so um, when, when I was asked whether he would be someone who could fill this bill in this lecture series, I said absolutely. So it's my great pleasure to introduce you to him. I have admonished Peter to leave time for questions. I do apologize <laughs> for my, uh, my lengthy this last time. But, uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Peter. Thank you. Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, if you look at the very bottom, you'll see a website, www.bahiamarpark.com. This PowerPoint I'll download by Friday and you can you know, get access to it. So just relax, don't take notes, you'll get to class in time. Um, doctor, thank you for having me, it's a true honor. I'm gonna tell you the most important thing first and then everything else from there goes downhill. The most important thing you need to know is if you get a degree from Florida Atlantic University, the world is your oyster. Um, I'm spending $50,000 a year sending my son to Davidson College. Um, another son I'm sending to a law school. And you know what? I have a bachelor's and a master's from Florida Atlantic University. I'm doing fine. I had great teachers. And what I found is if you put the dedication into it, you can go wherever you want. I've worked for the largest law firm. I worked for the largest private equity firm. I used to run a um, publicly traded company, and I'm proud of the fact that um, I went to FAU. So that's what matters most, and again, it's up to you to put the time in, because I know there's dedicated teachers that are here to teach you. Um, Charlie, thank you for the introduction of my background. I'm basically someone who wakes up in the morning, and I love the smell of concrete. I love concrete, I love development, I love seeing those big cranes. There aren't that many of them right now down here. And when I need my fix of nature, I go to North Carolina. I'm one of those bad people, I'm the developer. And part of what we're gonna talk about tonight is what should be is we should lose the labels. It should not be homeowner versus developer, environmentalist versus SOB, or whatever label you choose to use. Because at the end of the day, all of us enjoy South Florida. All of us should really try to work together. I'm gonna be very, very critical tonight of the last 20 years of planning. I'm gonna be critical for one reason. Sometimes it's good to creatively destroy what has happened so then we can put the pieces back together to try to do better. With that said, I'm sure there's been many, many good things that have happened over the last 20, 25 years of growth management. 
And I don't want to take away from that, but I think this is an opportunity in an academic setting to be a little bit critical, and then from there we can see, well, how can we do better? This is the summary of my lecture. 1990, I was a young lawyer here in Fort Lauderdale, one of these buildings. The 1985 Growth Management Act just passed. Biggest mistake of my career. I was getting my master's in economics at FAU in Boca Raton. Dr. DeGrove was doing this thing called growth management. No one had an idea what it was. And I could have gone to be one of his assistants, but I stayed in the economic department to be a teacher and assistant because it paid $3,000 a semester instead of $2,500. And I didn't know what growth management was. If only I jumped at that time, I maybe could have been in a much better situation. No one knew what it was. I think there was a lot of good ideas, but my greatest criticism is we seem to have really cared a lot about the planning process for the sake of the process. And as we go through tonight, the lessons I want to learn, it's not just about the plans. It also has to be the vision behind the plans, the people behind the plans. As we move on to where we are today, even though I think there were exciting times when I started my career in 1985, 1990, I think there's exciting times right now. We have probably the biggest battle coming up right now in land use in Florida that has happened in two decades, and I'll get into that a little bit later tonight. But the most important thing is, if we don't do things different, this little asterisk here basically says, if we don't change our paradigm, if we don't have new leadership, 2010 and 2030 will look the same. And it's really up to you planners, is my proposition tonight, to make sure that 2030 is different than 2010. If you guys don't get it, and if you guys don't change, when one of you do this lecture um, 20 years from now, you can just take my notes and change the dates because it's going to be the same problem all over again. So this is really an exciting time for you um, at that point. I'm going to go through this hopefully very, very quickly. I'm from New York, I can talk quick. The goal is to give you an overview. I really want to get to the Q&A session at the end. The biggest problem is people come to Florida and then they change their mindset. They want no one else to come here. The problem is we keep on growing. Even though people seem to be going to North Carolina and they're going to other places, Florida has continued to grow and will always grow. We will have six million more people over the next 20 years coming to Florida. That's like all of Missouri or all of Tennessee coming to Florida right now. Where are they gonna go? I assume you all know what that means, NIMBY, not in my backyard. That's one of the biggest problems. No one really wants this new growth to come here. They have their little piece of paradise. They don't want more traffic. They don't want more people. They don't want more things to block their view. And to me, if we don't change that format, I think we're destined to repeat the same mistakes. We need to better educate the fact that there are six million more people coming to Florida. If we don't, I think you're gonna have a very frustrating career ahead of you. There's really four places these people can go. They're either gonna go into beach redevelopment, they're going to go into urban redevelopment. They're going to go into what I'm calling new suburban urbanization. Or they're going to go into rural land development. Broward County no longer has item four. We basically destroyed, there's nothing left. So you really have to go to Collier County or other counties. But Broward County has many opportunities for one, two, and three. And there's going to be opportunities, and I think there's going to be a mixture over the next 20 years of where people go. What I want to do tonight is show you Boca Raton example on the ocean, Fort Lauderdale on the ocean, Fort Lauderdale downtown. Then you come out here to Sunrise, where I gotta be honest with you, when I was your age, doing where you were, I never thought people would be put in development out here. And this is Collier County, this is Naples, off the map, right in the middle of the Everglades. I mean, technically it's not the Everglades, but it's the Everglades. We're starting to develop in the Everglades. These are really the four frameworks of where development's gonna go. I'm gonna run through this quickly, and then we're gonna use it as a framework to study a little bit deeper. 
This is a project in Boca Raton that Wendy and Charlie and I were involved with in the past. It was an old six-story, 30-unit building. We knocked it down and we put a 10-story um, luxury high-rise. 30 units in both cases. Um, it was a good use of property. The infrastructure was all, already there. We didn't need to bury an infrastructure. This is the Boca Raton Beach Club. When you leave, you'll see a picture on the wall of the Boca Raton Beach Club. Those cabanas we've taken down and we've put in its place a new building. This is being built right now. It will open next week. I'm sorry, in about two months. Two months, I apologize. This is the case study for tonight. Has anyone seen Bahia Mar before? That's here in Fort Lauderdale. It's over on the beach. If you go there now, it's going to ready for the boat show. The boat show is like having the Super Bowl every year in Fort Lauderdale. I'm going to use this as a case study. This is a view from Pier 66 looking back towards Fort Lauderdale. You see the red um, circle around that condo. And you can see it again. And you can see we're right next door here, I believe. And obviously that's the building that is that side. That's another option. We have to, now some people might, my wife would say, oh my God, you got to be crazy. That thing is ugly. Well, the bottom line is, from a planner point of view, that is beautiful. It's putting people in downtown where they can walk, where they can, you know, hopefully use less cars. I mean, from a planner's point of view, we need to be having more and more compact growth. The problem with this picture is I wish there was also a high-speed rail that would take you from there to the suburbs and to your office. That's maybe 20, 30 years out, but we need to be thinking in those terms. This is a condominium. Now you might say, oh, it looks like Miami Beach. No. If you look beyond, that's the Everglades. I keep on shaking my head. I can't believe they put two condos next to the Swordgrass Mills Mall looking onto the Everglades. They're not sold. But take a step back. Maybe it's not a bad idea. Would you rather build new cities on the edge of the Everglades? Or would you rather go into the Everglades and build? Now, if you look here, that is Everglades. I mean, I use that word with a small e. It may not be technically Everglades National Park. But that's Ave Maria. There's something called um, rural land stewardship trust or areas or something. Basically, it's... a I don't want to say gimmick, but it's a way for developers to take a whole bunch of land that they could never really develop, take 80% of it, give it to a conservation easement, and develop the rest. And if we keep on doing that throughout the rest of um, Florida, has anyone ever driven to Orlando from here? You take the turnpike. You know how once you get past Fort Pierce, it gets pretty sparse for 90 miles? Well, there's people who would like to do this, that whole 90 miles the whole way up. Well. What I just showed you are four options for Florida's future. Redevelop the beach, redevelop our downtowns, go to the edge a little bit and create new cities and plantation and sunrise, West Del Rey, or continue to do what we've done best for the last 50 years, and that's to take nature and put concrete on it. And this is some more pictures of the downtown in Ave Maria. Looks real quaint. Look, that could be Meisner Park, Boca Raton, that could be right here in Las Solas right in the middle of the Everglades. Sprawl, baby, sprawl. If someone said to me, describe the last 20, 30 years of growth management, I think that's probably the best way to describe it. And it's really up to you. If we don't change, the same stuff is going to happen again and again. The real question is, can we accept these four development types efficiently, economically, environmentally, socially, and politically, so that we can have an enhanced economy and quality of life? Or is Florida sustainable? Now the problem with what we do, we come up with these new buzzwords. Everything now is green, everything's sustainable. I don't think when I started out we used those words or that color, but it's really can we continue the way we've done? And that's really a question for you to help you know decide. Governor Graham, even though he went on to service later in the U.S. Senate, back in 1985 set the following standard. 
Florida has neither the ability nor the desire to hold its growth. Instead, our goal is to manage that growth in a manner that enhances our economy and our quality of life. <coughs> what I like about this is you have a very objective standard, money, but then you have a very subjective standard, quality of life. The most important thing is the governor at the start of the 1985 Growth Management Act used the word end, which means both, not either or. The goal is to be able to make our economies expand, but also protect our quality of life. It should not be an either or, it should be both. This is the goal that the governor set, and quite frankly, it's really up to you to ask the question, is that still the right goal 25, 30 years later? The most toughest thing about what I think this growth management debate boils down to is define quality of life. Is it a subjective view, or is it the view for the good of the city? There's many people who take this attitude, if I can see your development, it should not happen. If I have to wait another traffic light cycle in my car to go to Publix, you should not be allowed to develop. You go back to that original chart where you had 13 million people, then 18 million, and then 24. As people continue to come here, the new people are causing the problems that the existing people once caused for the old original people, and it continues and continues. Um, the fundamental question is, do we compare the good old days of Florida, or do we compare it to, it's still better than our friends in New York who are shoveling snow today? I would respectfully suggest to you, many people have a better quality of life today than even people up north, even though it may not be where it was in the past. Part of your job is to help everyone change their framework. And again, these are the questions you have to ask. Was the standards that Governor Graham set for proper? Are they proper today? I think they are the goals that we should go after. I put the word failed in red, in quotes. You can ask environmentalists, you can ask developers, you can ask governments, you can ask citizens. I don't think anyone is in love with the final results of the 1985 Growth Management Act. Um, I think we can do better. And what I'm going to try to suggest to you by a framework that I always like to go to is a way how to do better. And that's this book by Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I don't know if anyone's read it. It was a national bestseller. It's, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I like things simple. I can count to seven. And it basically says if you begin with the end in mind, habit two, if you put first things first, habit three, and if you think win-win, habit four, you can do well. I'll leave it to you if you're curious to go look at what habit one, five, six, and seven are. But I've taken the meat of that, and I'm going to run through quickly, I hope quickly, how I think the Growth Management Act could have been done better if this was the framework we had at the very start. I don't think there was a shared vision. I think we had a lot of smart people creating a lot of plans. I was part of that process back then. A lot of young planners were hired with very little experience. We had a state plan, we had a regional plan, we had county plans, we had local plans that were all supposed to be consistent with one another. What does that mean, consistent? No one really knew. The planning process took a life of its own, and I don't think people took a step back and said, where do we want to go? You know, what vision, where, where's the roadmap taking us? If you get a chance, you'll see a model I have here at the start of a project. And as I go through my current project for here, Mark, the level of technology, the GIS, the renderings, the computer models that we have today that we probably take for granted, were not used back then. No one really had a framework. It was a two-dimensional framework of a comp plan. Residential here, industrial there, commercial there, and you had some tax that's supposed to be consistent. I don't think people knew what happened, what was supposed to happen. If you don't know where you're gonna go, then if you're the resident in your million dollar home and someone wants to develop, you're gonna get frustrated. But if you were taught up front, hey, six million more people have come into Florida, they're gonna affect your lifestyle because they're gonna use the roads, they're gonna use the sunshine, they're gonna use the same few shades that you have, it maybe would have been a lot less friction if we had a better idea of education. 
And that's kind of like one of the things I think you can do better going forward, is to make sure the current citizens know what the future has in store. Um, the first question at the top is really the most important to everyone. What will Florida look like? What will South Florida look like? Broward County, Fort Florida, but most important, what will my neighborhood look like? And if you can help let people know that, I think it's a better process that you can take them through. Consensus building needs to be more than just a word. It needs to be an action at the core of our plan. Education, education, education. You really need to educate the people. The worst thing is when homeowners come to a meeting when there's a new project, and the developers say, but wait a minute, I'm legally allowed to develop this. Why are you fighting me? Well, a lot of it's because they're selfish. But a lot of it is, is they don't realize that that developer has those rights because no one really did a good job to lay out that vision of where the city's going to go. If it takes you 12 minutes to go to Publix today, and it's going to take you 17 minutes in the year 2030, and you know that coming in before you buy your house, and you say, well, I'll either drive five more minutes or I can stay in Cleveland. You know, do I want to come down to Florida? You know, and a lot of it gets down to it's your job to let people know there will be more growth, there will be more, you know, delays. Prices will go up. That's part of what I think planning needs to do. Okay, habit three. I don't think we put first things first. I think we were just trying to create some academic planning process of internal consistency to the left, to the right, to the up, to the thing. You read the state planning um, plan, I think it was chapter 187, I'm not sure. It's kind of like mother pie, motherhood. It means everything, but it means nothing. You know, we're trying to be consistent with it. At the end of the day, I think we went down the right road with the wrong vision, because no one knows why we were going down that road. And it was all about getting these plans adopted. And it was all about this mean person up in Tallahassee at DCA saying your plan's not in compliance. And it all got down to what do I have to do to get DCA to accept my plan to make it compliant? No one was asking, what do I have to do to make sure the citizens of the town really know what's in the plan? It's make sure some government can check a box. And what I'm going to suggest to you, the planning process is better if it has realistic goals back to people and not just checking planning boxes along the way. We need to set priorities. We must protect our beaches, we must protect our water supply. Maybe we protect the Everglades. All of it, some of it, I don't know. I mean, it seems like we've done damage to it, but we still survive. And if we're going to spend a billion dollars of taxpayers' money to make it better, we'll explain to the citizens why. Um, you know, some areas that are wetlands, maybe you can develop, others you can't. We're going to have to accept more traffic, we're going to have to accept more compact development. But what we cannot accept is people saying, I'm entitled to my view and my way of life. There's 18 million people here now, there's 6 million more coming. We need to set priorities on what we're going to do as a community. For half of you in the room, you might be upset by this, but we cannot protect it all. I might be in the minority, we can't develop it all either. There has to be that balance, and that's really what I think the planning process has to be. To me, I think this is the biggest failure of the growth management process. We created a winner versus loser situation, not a win-win. And nine out of 10 times, I can afford every lobbyist, every land use lawyer, I can afford the best. Usually the developers are gonna win, not all the time. It would be better to take those resources and not have to fight the system, but put them back into the project. I think it would be better if we had a system where we really went for the win-win. Look, nobody really wants affordable housing or more traffic or more commercial or higher taxes, but these are the bad things. I use the word bad in quotes that are gonna come. Every community needs to accept their fair share of certain uses um, as we continue to grow. This is a good summary. Without a shared vision, or beginning with the end in mind, have it too. And by failing to set top priorities and putting first things first, habit three, we created a zero-sum game with winners and losers instead of a win-win situation. 
I'm just one little guy. I was never secretary of DCA. Maybe my opinion means nothing. But if someone says to me, throw a rock at the last 25 years of planning in Florida, that's the rock. We failed. We also failed because the second bullet, we forgot to put money. Our geniuses, in quotes, that go up to Tallahassee are very, very good at adopting laws, and they forget to put the money behind the laws. The 60-day legislative session is up, and they fly back down. And now local governments have to figure out, well, how do we fund this? As we go forward, any type of future um, growth management for Florida needs to have a funded source. Otherwise, we're destined to fail again and again and again. And again, I'm not trying to be critical for the sake of being critical. I'm being critical for the sake of let's try to learn as we go forward. I think we have to start over. I think the goals that Governor Graham set are the right goals. We just need to look at it with a different mindset. It's not going to be easy. One of my favorite quotes is John Steinbeck. It is the nature of a man as he grows older to protest against change, particularly change for the better. No one who lives in Florida today thinks six million more people coming to Florida is better. So if that's considered worse than it's going to happen, that means people are going to continue to protest this process. And you're just going to have local governments denying plans for political process. You're going to have lawsuits. You're going to have wasted resources. We need to do a better job of educating the people in Florida about what's going to continue to happen and happen and happen. It needs to be a very fluid process. And remember, we have sunshine 365 days a year. It's still a great place to be. And the bottom quote says, remember, looking at all the buildings in a compact development as you sit in traffic a little longer in South Florida is still better than shoveling snow in New York, right? And if it's not, you know, I-95 also goes north. You know, it's kind of like, we have to, we can't be selfish. We, good people plan, great people lead. It's an opportunity for all of you to be leaders. My generation kind of like destroyed most of Broward County. You guys have the next opportunity to protect what's left and maybe make it better as we go forward. The last bullet is really about you. New planners for the next 20 years need to look beyond pure compliance with the technical, comprehensive planning process and become more result-orientated to build a sustainable economy and community in a balanced, non-adversarial manner. That should be your mission if you choose to be a planner in South Florida for the next 20 years. I'm going to run quickly through the Behemoth Project. The Behemoth Project is a half-billion-dollar project I'm working on in South Florida. It's one example of how you take these habits, these three habits, and you try to apply them to that one project. And then you say, gee, if it works there, maybe it works for a county, maybe it works for the whole state. But it also gives you a chance to see some of the graphics and the quality that we have that, quite frankly, we did not have 25 years ago. So first, habit two, begin with the end in mind. The redevelopment plans for Bahia-Mar had a clear vision. It's what I, as the developer, wanted. But at the same time, I was very fluid. I needed to work with the neighbors, and that's what had to be done. The plans were three-dimensional. I was able to let people see what was going to happen. I was able to take homeowners and say, this is what your backyard's going to look like in a model. You can see a model here. We had computer renderings. Some, some of them said, great, I see it. Now I'm going to fight you. Others said, gee, no, that's not really that bad. You make a little change here or there. And that's why I think better graphics makes for a better process. That's the more sometime in the 20s or 30s. This is when they started to develop it in 1949. This is 1950. Can you stop it now? 50 again. Right now, we don't have a state income tax because we rely upon a service tourism based economy. Bahia Moore is set up for that. We needed to make sure we were able to protect our tourism interest. Those were the two goals, economics, economics, economics. And you just can't plan in a vacuum and talk only about uses and environmental until you realize what Governor Graham said. He used the conjunction of the word end. 
You must protect your economy, you must also protect quality of life. You need both. Then you gotta look for the win-win. To me, this is, I think, the foundation of what the Bahiamar development team's done. We worked with the city for three years. We tried to get to a yes situation. We really tried to be flexible. And you look at the second bullet, it says fingerprints. You have the fingerprints of the entire community all over our plan. It's their plan as much as our plan. And I think the last bullet's a good summary. We could only get to this win-win situation, habit four, by first having a shared vision, habit two, and by setting the top priorities, habit three. It really works together. I think the plan and process in Florida had good intentions. I think it was user-friendly enough. This is probably three years of my life, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of community outreach. I have done everything that needs to be done, except Charlie and I have to still go to the city commission probably in December. We've worked with the neighbors, we've worked with the advisory committees. Charlie says that I work for a very large developer. I do. We just bought, you know, SeaWorld, Bush Gardens. We own a lot of things. We deal with the billions, not the millions. We came to town and we did what was right on a local level. We reached out. We really took consensus building to the extreme. I've been in more people's living rooms than unbelievable I would ever imagine. We did not hide behind the fact we're a developer. We did not hide behind the money. We really tried to work together with the neighbors. Because at the end of the day, it's the neighbors that have to you know, live with this community um, in the project. So I really can't overstate the importance of community outreach. That was what we first envisioned, very dense project back in 2006. And it would have made us a lot more money. We worked with the communities. They said, you know what, we want a buffer. So we added a buffer on the very back. But we still had buildings in 200 by 200 foot planning squares because that's what the code said. I'm not a big fan of zoning codes. Zoning codes make you very tunnel vision. I love plan unit developments because it allows you to be creative. We then started to study the property. We said instead of developing where we could from a legal point of view, let's give up this development rights and let's start to maybe keep a park there and push the density back away from the neighbors, have open space for the public, and this is what we came up with working with the neighbors. But then they said it's good but not great. We think your buildings are too boxy, make them less massive, make them more wow. Do you see that squared? We work with the neighbors, we now have three levels within the buildings. That's about um, 15, 18, and 21 stories. They're also thinner. This is a park bigger than a football field, 23 feet above um, grade, hides the park in underneath. This here is three and a half years of working with the neighbors on a win-win situation. We protect the boat show, we expand the boat show. We protect tourism, it's the Waldorf story in the back, so it's able to meet my top priorities of what had to be done. This is, again, the site plan where you have the Waldorf story Another hotel, restaurants, this is the park. The real experience for people who don't have the million dollar boat or go to the Waldorf Astoria, these are all restaurants, retail shops all through here. It's like a miniature Meisner Park or city place that we now have on the waterfront. We've really done this to really make it be a community destination. This is just the mixed use development. I'm a big fan of mixed use. I think as you go through your career, most of your projects would be mixed use, compact development, because you can build less parking, because you can share the parking, you waste less resources, and it's better for the community. It's also exciting to visit. I'm gonna run through some pictures real quick, and then we'll go on to some text. That's the Waldorf Astoria proposed building here with the residential in the back. This is standing in the property looking towards the ocean, very modern architecture of the Waldorf Astoria. This is the middle drop-off where I say you would have restaurants and shops. You know, these are cafes and that walks up to the park. This is at the base of the residential buildings. This is the intercoastal. And then you have a walkway here and then another walkway and then the park goes up here. 
with a you know bistro for the community to enjoy. This is the park. It really becomes the largest nursery in Fort Lauderdale. For 10 months, I grow plant material. Then the boat show comes, I take the plant material out, I put it in my other hotels, I move it to other facilities, I then have a boat show, and then I replant. So basically, it becomes a green roof 10 months out of the year, it becomes a nursery, and it really hides the parking underneath, and it makes a community destination. I started with seven levels of parking open, just like any of this right here. By working with the community, by working with the city, we did better. And that's the view from across the intracoastal looking back. This is really how the community can enjoy the pedestrian aspects of it. That's the park. This is the cross section. Two levels of parking under the park. No one will see any of the cars. When the boat show comes to town, they have more space on top, as well as below. As I said, that was one of our conditions to protect and expand the boat show. Instead of developing what we could legally, we push it back in taller buildings. And again, that's what the code says. By moving it back, you come up with a better design. Don't be afraid to give more than the code requires. This is us giving more noise conditions, use restrictions and lighting restrictions up front. We want to be a good neighbor. We worked with the city's outside planning consultant where their master plan includes our property shown there. And it's always good when you're giving the city a whole bunch more money as well. Um, again, that's our plan. Real quick, very self-serving, but I think by following these habits of beginning with the end in mind, putting first things first, think win-win, we've been able to get this project 95 yards down the field. And if I didn't do it that way, I think I would have stubbed my toe much a lot more. And I really think that what I've done on a micro level with my team, new plan is needed to do on a macro level over the next 20 years. We have to get rid of that us versus them mentality. Okay, now I move into the next section of the presentation. Maybe a little bit more controversial, because I'm starting to use the F word for failures again. I think the Growth Management Act failed. I think there was no shared vision. I think there was no top priority set. I think there's no win-win situation. And what that has caused over the last 25 years has caused where we are today. We've set up a battle between Senate Bill 360 and something called hometown democracy. The fact that the parties could not work together collectively over the last 25 years, I think has now led to what I'm calling a true battle. Senate Bill 360, some people might call it the Developers Relief Act from a bad economy and transportation concurrency. Basically, it brings a smile to my face. It basically guts concurrency, it helps developers, it gives them extensions, it says you don't need to work on traffic anymore. That's, again, that's a very broad brush. I think there's many people in this room, there's definitely many people in the environmental community, neighborhood community, who don't like Senate Bill 360. Most governments try to stop it, most um, third party groups try to stop it, and some deal was made in Tallahassee, well beyond my pay grade, and the governor signed it. But I think it's fair to say it's more of a pro-business, pro-development type of bill. I should be happy, but I'm not. Because when one side goes too far to the extreme, whatever short-term gains you get, you lose them, because then the other side comes up with something called hometown democracy. And that's where, if, I don't know if you know about this, but next November on the ballot, there's gonna be an opportunity for a constitutional amendment that says every land use plan amendment that ever gets processed must be voted on by the citizens. Now my mother is going to vote for this in November. She's a nice little old lady. She'll vote, probably all democratic, against my wishes. And then she'll get down to Amendment 4, and it's going to say, hometown democracy. Wow. I believe in hometown democracy. That sounds nice. It's like Chevrolet and apple pie and all those good things. 
So what's going to happen, because, in my opinion, the last 25 years, people were going to winners versus losers, not win-wins, because we were looking for battles. We've now created such an extreme that, based on something called chaos theory, with the butterfly effect, you know, the butterfly flaps its wings in Africa, we get a hurricane. I think over the last 25 years, we've brought this on ourselves. And um, I'm not sure what's going to happen. You have Senate Bill 360 was passed, litigation's been filed, there's a glitch bill trying to fix it. Um, you know, I use the words and quotes that inmates run into asylum. You know, one of the reasons why we select local politicians is to let them make these decisions. It really should not be land use by referendum, that's my opinion. Um, I use the word, it's sheep in wolf's clothing. It looks like it's pro-community, it looks like it's pro-environmental, but it's not. Because think about this. If I have to go to a referendum to get all of those existing residents that don't want to change to approve the amendment, I won't build on the beach, I won't build downtown, I won't even build on the edge in Sunrise. I'll go to Collier County or Henry County, I'll go some other place where I don't need a comp plan amendment, and then I will do something called sprawl. And I will take resources, and I will destroy the environment, and we'll make money. So what looks like a pro-environmental, pro-community bill I think has those unintended consequences of repeating the same mistakes for the last 25 years. Okay, what's going to happen? If hometown democracy passes, there'll be litigation. I guarantee it. There's enough pro-developers, Republicans in the state legislature, they will try to undo the bill. I'm not going to say they're not going to follow the Constitution, but there's ways to restructure things. Maybe we do overlay comp plan amendments in the state level. Maybe we gut it some other way. There's no way they're going to let that stand. If Hopetown democracy fails, they may not go away. They haven't gone away yet. They might try it on a local level. In either case, the battle continues. What I'm saying to you as someone who's made millions winning the battles, we don't need to battle anymore. We shouldn't battle anymore. We should learn to work together. Now, I, did, I, w I didn't believe that 25 years ago. 25 years later, I do. There's a term, creative destruction. Maybe we needed to get to this point of this battle of Senate Bill 360 versus hometown democracy to start all over again. After the dust settles and people start to shift their paradigm and they learn about shared vision, setting top priorities and win-win situations, and they really embrace Governor Graham's two-pronged test of an enhanced economy and quality of life, maybe we can work together. And this is the most important thing for you to realize. New planners, that's you, need to provide the leadership to make this happen. You're being taught a lot in school, that's good. You need to go beyond what you're being taught. You need to go beyond the plans. You need to begin with the end in mind. You need to say, I also live in this community. What do I want it to look like? How do I help people get there? I believe in building bridges. It's a lot better. Real quick, I think there's four things we need to do. Number one is what I've been speaking about for the last 40 minutes. Number two is I think we need to move away from a regulatory framework to a resource allocation framework. It's very simple. Growth management should not be that complicated. Six million new people have come into Florida. We only have so much stuff that can go around as far as water, natural resources, and concrete and asphalt to make roads. Allocate those resources and try to find the dollars to do it. That's growth management in a nutshell. Anything else beyond that is over complication. I think the 1985 Growth Management Act overcomplicated what's a straightforward process. I think we need to consolidate government, and I think we need to provide a permanent funding source. I understand that local governments have home rule powers. I understand that local residents are going to still pry out but protect my views. But I think we need to allocate, among all 67 counties, these 6 million people. 
there was a series of cases, and I don't mean this to be a legal discussion, called Mount Laurel, basically saying you just can't say only rich people and big acre estates get to come around town. Basically, they said, no, you've got to also do your fair share of affordable housing and other things. We need to do better on allocation um, throughout our counties. We have consumed natural resources of water. We have created resources, transportation, and then we have protected natural resources, wetlands and other systems. Between those three things, some of them we're going to develop, some of them we're going to preserve, and we're going to make sure all 67 counties share fairly in the process. This will never happen because there's too many people who will not give up the power. But if someone said to me, how should we fix this? I'm not a big fan of our current state government where you have something called the administration commission where the governor has to share power with three other people. I believe we elect one governor to lead us. Leadership is very important. That governor should appoint a growth or a sustainability czar. You should consolidate environmental, planning, and traffic together. That's the Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Community Affairs, Department of Transportation. At the end of the day, you got roads, you got water, the state controls them, and they better allocate them out. Then once you've done this on a state level, you then consolidate your five water management districts, your regional planning councils, and your metropolitan planning organizations into five. And quite frankly, all of the resources are here. They control them. They work with local governments on allocation of densities. If Fort Lauderdale says, you know what, we're very happy just as we are, we don't want any of those six million people. Well, they can't do that because then they're gonna have consequences of they're not gonna get tax dollars, they're not gonna get other resources, blah, blah, blah. There needs to be an allocation. If we don't have someone driving the train, it goes back to where I think we were. We had all these plans with no one going with it. Um, this is very radical. This will never happen. If I ever try to produce it, there's people who probably shoot me because you have people who have turf that's being consolidated here and here, but it's probably the right thing to do because to me, there's no difference between a road and water. I need them both. Why not have one government consolidate and push them down to us? If you think that's radical, wait until you get to this. You need money to make this work. You know, let's go to the last one. 2.5% state income tax. Most people come from up north where they pay 4, 5, 6, 7% or higher state income tax. We don't have a state income tax. I don't think we have politicians that have the political will to get approved. That's why I suggested maybe push it out to 2025 I also suggest state income, you know, a penny sales tax, gas tax, increase the millage on the water management, um, and also local governments. If we don't make a commitment to fund the infrastructure, whether it be protect the water supply, protect the ecosystems, provide the transportation, and if you think roads are expensive, when do you do mass transit? I mean, if we don't do it, we're going to get frustrated, but we need to make a real commitment. Because the last bullet kind of like sums it up. Even with shifting paradigms to make improvements to growth management, as I suggested this evening, those efforts are destined to fail, again, if we don't have a dedicated funding source. Governor Graham's first quote is here. It'd be really nice if Governor Graham in the year 2015, I mean, sorry, 2015, when they passed the 2015 Florida Forever Now Growth Leadership, I changed management to leadership, and funding that can really say we now got it right. Because we have the funding source, because we have a shared vision, and we're not working in an adversarial framework. Now even though I'm saying it needs to be a top-down state regional government telling locals what to do, I believe the opposite of how it's going to get done. I believe the people like myself that make millions and millions and millions for their owners are not going to bring the change that's necessary. I don't think the environmental groups or the person in their $5 million home that doesn't want to see any more development is going to do it. 
So all the usual suspects are not going to change the system. But all I know is that we put a lot of tax dollars into the university system. We also have Nova and Miami and other private schools as well. But imagine if all of the private and public urban, reg urban regional planning departments and law schools in the state got together and said, gee, the last generation messed it up, how do we fix it? And you come up with a plan, I'm calling it Florida Forever Now, you can call it whatever you want. The reason I'm saying Florida Forever Now is funding out there under a program called Florida Forever, and I'm saying let's do Florida Forever Now and get it done, finally. But imagine, I don't know what you do when you're a university president, but imagine if all of these smart people, that means all of you in the room, figure out what we should do, and you go to the university presidents, and you get them to sign a joint letter. And you go to the state legislature and say, look, these people aren't going to fix it. We're telling you as the smart guys is what you need to do. You then work it up, and that's how you get what Governor Graham wanted back in, two, in 1985. If you guys don't provide the leadership, I'm telling you 2030 is going to look just like 2010. I'll bet you $1,000. If we always do what we have always done, then we will always get what we always got. I was an economic, not an English major. It's that simple. My plan was more for discussion purposes, because it's probably radical. That's not the point. The point is, if you don't start to think in terms of doing things different for the next 20 years, I can tell you what the next 20 years has, because I just lived the last 20 years. And it's that simple. So it's really up to you. You need to really change the process. It's not a bad process. I just think it was too theoretical, and it did it incorporate the human element. I don't think it created enough vision of where we're going. And it really made it be winner versus loser, zero-sum game. And we didn't really create opportunities to try to get to that win-win. Um, as you and I were spoken on the way up, you know, I can't think of any better thing to be studying and any better profession to be in than real estate development, community development, public-private partnerships planning. It's exciting. There's exciting times ahead, and quite frankly, you have the ability to decide Florida's future. You know, I'm one of those people who's about to retire, go up to North Carolina for five months and 29 days, because North Carolina has a state income tax. So I will cheat the system like all of my neighbors, and I will act like I'm a Florida resident, here for six months and one day to avoid taxes. So I say that because I don't want to pay more taxes, but quite frankly, if everyone in the state who has the economics to make these decisions is from a state that does pay taxes, we probably need to be looking at sources at that point. But doctor, thank you for the opportunity. This was really to try to kick off some discussions that are a little bit radical and where we need to go. And I mean, no disrespect for the people who've worked hard for the last 25 years. Um, because many good things have happened, and probably things would be a lot different if we didn't have growth management, but it's up to you to make them different going forward. Thank you. All right, time for questions. Um, I fundamentally disagree with your point of view that planners have to come up with a vision and the failure is that we have not come up with the right vision. And if we need these smart people to figure this out. I think the failure in the growth management is not including the public at the ground level and only allowing the public to comment at the end of a plan is already done. I see your way about fixing this is gonna repeat the same issue, that planners see themselves as professionals as having the answers, planners see themselves as being comprehensive, the ability to be com comprehensive, and clearly that's not the case. Planners have failed, where they have failed, is to include the public in the process at the very beginning and all the way through. And I think that's what needs to be done. Um, and otherwise, planners are going to continue to be nothing but handmaidens to develop. That's what we have to come. 
rubber stampers, bureaucrats, board developers. And the evidence would be is that we didn't have planning or growth management in Florida, I think the landscape looked exactly the same. I think you and I are probably saying the same thing, maybe from a different angle. I believe, and that's why I try to show you the list of all the community outreach, that I think you need to engage with the public. I think there should be a rule that the minute you move down from New York to Florida, before you're allowed to buy the house, you should sit down with the local planner before you're allowed to sign the contract. And he says to you, for the next 25 years, this is what your life's going to be like based on decisions. But as we work together, we can maybe make them different here. As someone who spent years trying to avoid the public, hiding behind lawyers and corporate shields, I'm telling you, it's better to work with the public early on. And as I was trying to say in this process, I have the support of the beach community, not everyone, but I got the support of the two largest beach groups because I spent two and a half years early on reaching out with them. I redesigned the building, spent over 800000 on redesign because I value their opinion as opposed to, you know what, I got the votes, legally I can do it, let's just go get it done. So I think I agree with you, and I think going forward there needs to be better outreach. And I, But again, it gets back to that respect where it can't be as you started to say, handmade and for the developers versus community, it really has to be we're all, look, the sun shines on all of us, we all enjoy the same lifestyle, we all need to be in that group. So I'm just saying I'd like to get there quicker, and we haven't gotten there yet to that point. Oh, no. um, you use the, uh, the analogy of New York, I'm presuming New York City, uh, quality of life versus South Florida. Um, but in New York City, there are parks all over the place, thriving streetscapes. Uh, the, the quality of life there is measured in, in things other than weather. In South Florida, um, recent development in the last 20 years seems to have been geared towards exclusivity, luxury, uh, isolated pockets of, of luxury that isn't really made available to the public. So I'm wondering, what do you see uh, as developers' role and how can developers help uh, increase that streetscape and that thriving community beyond the walls of their development? What can they do to, to help? First, I painted with a very broad brush when I said New York. That's where I'm personally from. I just meant the cold weather, warm weather. There's a lot of great lifestyle in our, in our northern cities. You know, I serve on the city's um, affordable housing advisory committee. I'm his chair. You know, there's something called the law. It has to be a rational nexus. I got all the money in the world, but you just can't say solve, you know, affordable housing, solve the traffic problem, solve the lack of parks, then we'll let you build your building. There has to be some type of connectivity. With that said, do I think there should be more impact fees? Of course. Um, do I think a lot of impact fees, like they were going to do an affordable housing impact fee in Broward County tied it to commercial um, development, it got killed about two years ago because of the economy only. If the economy comes back, they should bring it back. Will the developers complain? Of course they will. But at the end of the day, there's, the problems we have today are so deep from two or three decades of lack of funding. If we don't really change our tax base, and maybe use of fees. It's not just ask the developer to pay his his, his fee fair share, because that's not going to do any good at this point. You know, we really need to do much more. Um, I also think there needs to be, you know, it's one of these things, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? What comes first, mass transit or high level development? They both have to happen. That's why I'm saying the state needs to take a leadership role. And if the state was to say, we're now going to really do not tri-rail, but something that people would actually work and ride to, and then you can build these neighborhoods and parks and have more people involved in an inclusionary way. It's a good thing. I was doing some development in Chapel Hill, a very, very liberal mindset, where they expect you to do 10% affordable housing as a minimum. And you know that's just the way business gets done. If I was to go down to City Hall and say all developers should do a 10% affordable housing minimum, I'd be shocked. You know, so there has to be also a mindset of the change of the people, not just from one developer who might have a conscience um, at that point. 
We don't win if we put walls. Boca Raton is nice, but Boca Raton is one gated community after one gated community where you don't know your neighbor four houses down. I go to North Carolina, I know everyone. You know, so, but that's not a developer problem. It's also the way life has been. But I hope we can get to a better inclusiveness. I think it works better. You know, in my class, uh, some of my students are here. After we have this discussion of sprawl and how we got to where we are and where we need to go, I ask them to write a memo on their position on smart growth. And I always find it interesting that uh, you'll find maybe 10 or 15 percent of the students say, no, I don't like it. I, I don't think smart growth is a good thing because I like the suburban lifestyle. I like to see, I like to live that lifestyle and therefore I don't like to see that lifestyle cut back and they're against densification. 10%, okay? And the other 90% are say, oh sure, I'm all in favor of smart growth, except I don't like the affordable housing part because I don't think people should be forced to live with other people. I don't like the density part. You know, and they go pick and choose the parts that they like about it. Everybody likes mixed use. Okay. But you know, it, even amongst ourselves, uh, the, planet, the, the future planners of America, uh, I don't think we're sold on some of these concepts yet. I don't think we, we've made that mindset transition. You know, when I was in junior high, I think they taught me Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, safety. I think the second one was being selfish. You know, whether you're the rich guy in the $5 million house on Ninja Coastal trying to stop my project because you can see it, or you're the future Donald Trump who someday might get to that level, everyone wants their little world to be perfect. They don't want change. And I think John Steinbeck's comment speaks volumes that even change for the better. I used to run a senior housing for very, very wealthy, wealthy people where they come to us and we took care of them for life. 80 years old, going to like Ritz Carlton for the rest of your life. One night, we gave them two crab cakes instead of one. Oh my God, I'll never make that mistake again. It was change. And even though we said, well, you can not eat it, you can eat it, well, we'll wrap it to take it home. The amount of difficulties that happened because it was changed for the better. It was two, not one. It didn't work. Um, it's tough. But you know something? We need to learn to really compromise. And if I can be a testimony for the last 25 years, I don't think there's anyone who's saying we won, whether it be 1,000 Friends of Florida, whether it be the Sierra Club, whether it be the Florida Builders Association. No one can look back at our record. We can look back at our bank accounts. We can look back at the asphalt and concrete, and maybe these isolated areas have been saved, but I don't think we've made paradise any better. I think New York Times, I'm sorry, Time Magazine about a dozen 